Who's first? Who's got a question? Raise your hand. Okay, Campo, go ahead. Uh, so, Bill, we were talking about the upper extremity and how it might either orient itself or compensate based on that more proximal patterning of mm -hmm. either thorax or what have you. Right. Um, so does it kind of go along the lines of like how they went through like impingement and instability where like the, the scapula is now positioned this way so the humerus would either compensate or orient with it and then la da 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 go along down the chain like that going through all like the different combinations essentially? Am I along the... The answer is yes. Okay. I mean, how, how often do you, are you, um, I mean, how do you even like assess, go into assessing that and then even utilizing that during like different interventions for people? Sure. Um, actually, I should, I should have uh, uh, Eric Oberst answer this question because we, we literally went through it today um, and then actually did it with a, a patient today where the, the, the orientation at the elbow. So, so it was a, uh, a patient with bilateral elbow issues and the orientations were actually different. And so we used a similar activity with a different um, uh, position to, to address it. So I'll, I'll run you through it. So if you can identify the, the position of the glenohumeral joint, right, which is typically done through whatever normal uh, measurement algorithm that you're doing, right? So you identify where the, where the humerus lies at the shoulder. And then you, you basically determine, based on the, the humeral position, what should I expect at the elbow? So for instance, if, uh, um, if I have an externally, a compensatory external rotation of the humerus, the expectation is that the form would initially follow it. So, so it would be a supinated forearm correct but the neutral position of the of the wrist and hand is the most purposeful position for activity so that means that you would pronate from a supinated position to a pronated position but because of the external rotation of the humerus if i was looking at pronation in isolation pronation should be limited right so if it's not, if it's not limited, then I know I've got a pathology in the lateral elbow. So again, motion occurs where it's not supposed to occur. So think of just the anterior hip, right? In, in a situation where you have a ligamentous laxity in the front of the hip. It's the same thing at the elbow. In fact, you can look at the elbow as a, as a hip, all right, or a pelvis. You can you actually look at it in the same way. Um, it would require me to draw it out, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this this type of presentation. But but it, it's very very doable. In fact, we, we could probably do it on the whiteboard um, at some point in time and record that for IFSU. And Lance just got a little bit of a woody right there when I said that. Um, but I probably shouldn't say woody on a, a record. <laughs> I can't edit it out. <laughs> 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 it's raw people it's yeah. live sorry um my bad but uh, again th th so th there's there's expectation so initially like i said the the form would follow wherever the the humerus is either oriented or um in a compensatory position the form would initially follow and then the hand and wrist would reorient to a neutral position. And then from there you can identify, well, should I have a limitation in pronation or supination? And if I don't, then I know I have to, to sort of shore up that area with, with muscle activity. So I'll give you, uh, for instance, I'm trying to remember today. Um, so his right shoulder was, was externally rotated. So that was, it was compensatory external rotation at the shoulder. Um, which means that he should be limited in pronation. He was not, which means that I need to uh, use the supinator at the elbow to compensate for the fact that he's got too much pronation. So, um, and in this case, if we're, if we're drawing an analogy, 
that supinator would function just like a right glute max would function in a right posterior hip pathology where there would be too much internal rotation. It's literally the same pattern. So if the hip internally rotates too much on the right side, in his case, he had too much pronation, which would look like internal rotation of the hip. So if you can picture that, uh, and again, I can draw it out on the whiteboard um, for another presentation at some point in time. So, so that, what I just said, actually makes sense to most people. Um, does that make so sense? You, yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, that, that's really easy to see too, how like, so supinator would be like ligamentous muscle for really anything happening on like that lateral elbow. Correct. And, and so um, if you see like a presentation of say um, like a, a valgus at the elbow. Yeah. All right. Then you know you've lost the medial compartment of the elbow. And so I need to use a pronator. So pronator teres. Mm -hmm. Right to bring the forearm back into normal orientation with the humerus. And so okay. for your for, for your sorry, are you, uh -huh. um, so for your intervention, are you essentially just having them do like a reach with supination or pro? No, okay. you got to involve the triceps, my friend, and that's where it gets really interesting. Tricep at the scapula. Um, first of all, it's triceps. There's three of them. Okay. Right. Get that right. All right. Um, yeah. Three on each arm. <laughs> well said. Um, and, but, but again, so, so here's the cool thing about triceps. And so let's take the long head out of the equation for a second. Okay. If you're looking at the posterior uh, brachium, all right, I've got the medial head and I've got the lateral head. Right. Bill, there. I have my uh, notebook I can grab quick, maybe for the picture that I okay. drew up on the you, screen. You have your amazing yeah. artwork? Yeah, it's amazing. You guys just wait. Okay. Well, I'll talk it through anyway. You go get that. Um, so, again, <laughs> looking at the posterior brachium. So, I've got the medial triceps and, and the lateral. The lateral is actually an internal rotator of the humerus. Sure. As, as long as there is, there is mm -hmm. a a load um, in, in the hand. So either, either the hand is fixed to the ground, like a push-up, or I have a weight in the hand, okay? okay. So I have a lateral, I, I have the lateral head of the triceps, it's an internal rotator, and the medial head of the triceps, which is an, uh, an external rotator. So Eric's trying okay. to make this anything reasonable, so he's got amazing artwork here. But and, I, and I know... Go ahead. We've gone over this with the quads, so would I just? Um... It's exactly like that. So, so yeah. where, where the where the VM is an external rotator of the femur, the VL is an internal rotator of the femur. So, so just flip it around, and now we have an analogy for the triceps, right? Yeah. So, so I'm going to use the triceps to internally and externally rotate the humerus to reorient the humerus as I also reorient the elbow at the same time. Okay, so if I have an externally rotated humerus and a pathology, yeah. and a pathology in the lateral elbow that I need supination for, the activity that I'm going to do is going to be internally rotated, so it's across your body here, and supinated. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do. And then I would extend the elbow as such. Okay, so I'm so I activate the component of triceps as an internal rotator of the humerus, compensate for the fact that I've already been er and then I get the supinator on at the same time. And so as I extend, I'm internally rotating the humerus, I'm supinating the forearm, and I realign the elbow all at the same time. Cool. By the way, you also realign the wrist because the wrist changes position with the, with the uh, compensatory activity of the forearm, but that's secondary for, for what we're talking about here. Cause you can use the wrist diagnostically to determine where the elbow actually is. But, but that, again, that's beside the point. The point is, is that I'm actually gonna use triceps, triceps and supinator in this case to reorient the elbow. I can also do the same thing with pronation. 
So if I, if I blew out the medial aspect of the elbow, so I've got a valgus deformity at the elbow, I can do the exact same activity for an externally rotated femur or externally rotated humerus by, by pronating and, and extending the elbow. So again, it all depends on, on where the orientation is. But you're going to use elbow extension each time because I need to activate the triceps to, to help with the, the reorientation of the humerus, right? And then the forearm reorients the elbow to the humerus. Okay. That was fun. Any more, Campo? Any follow-up? Um, not right now. I'm just going to process a little bit. Okay, you let that sit. Thanks. James, hi. Um, uh, does anybody else have a question? Jake. Hi, Jake. I have a question. If no one has a question. Do it, Did Patrick. You questions last time, I did. <laughs> I actually have like two questions, but I guess the first one is um, in terms of when you guys are training an athlete, what is your guys' philosophy on um, training him to minimize his risk of injury? Isn't that, isn't that what good training is, right? So I mean, this, are there any like objective markers that you're looking for or you keep track of? <sighs> Okay, so <laughs> Rufus is chuckling over here just for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, so, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on what type of athlete we're talking about um, and, you know, the intensity level that they're working at and such. So, for instance, and I always use, like, the soccer player sprinter comparison. You've probably heard me say that before. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? And, and so some of this is, is – measurement observation and then retesting right to determine what is optimal for each person because we don't know we have no idea um you know we might we might have a like conceptually you know uh, uh an athlete that functions in a very very specific environment a very predictive environment doesn't need as much variability so so maybe we don't need a, as much transverse plane variability in the hips so it's so a little less internal external rotation may, might be beneficial. So we kind of determine based on performance tests and measures as to what would be optimal for them. And then maybe we try to keep that as close as possible um, as they're working through their program. In, in other words, we're not going to necessarily maximize uh, variability and range of motion for every athlete. Mm. Um, from a health standpoint, yes. But we also have to consider the ability to generate intensity. So if you look at some of the, the recent literature on like uh, workload and, and the, the predictive injury risk and such. Uh, Tim Gabbett's work? Yeah. Yeah. If you look at that, it's like, well, if I have a reduction in intensity, then I lose fitness and that puts me at risk for injury. If I, if I increase intensity too fast, then I'm, I'm risking my, I, I lower my adaptive potential and therefore I'm, I'm at risk for injury. So, so we have to find this sweet spot in the middle somewhere, right? But this is just, all it is is test retest, right? Because we really don't know um, where that, that true risk is. We just know that you know, if they're not fit enough, they get hurt. If they're, too stressed, they get hurt. And I don't think it is, is absolute. I think they're, they're, they're doing the best that they can with those measures. I don't know if there's something magical about the 10%. It just seems to be that's about where things are right now as far as the research that we have. But I would imagine that there's going to be people that, that, you know, if they drop off, you know, just a few percentage points, they're probably going to be at higher risk. But we just don't know who those people are. Um, so... But I would say that when you're training somebody, can somebody mute their, their Patrick, while you're not talking, can you mute? There we go. Thanks, man. Um, but when we're training somebody, I think the intent is, is to, to train to perform. And in doing so, if we're doing this properly, then that does mitigate the risk as much as possible. And, and so if we're, 
if we're monitoring intensities and volumes and responses, then we can identify, okay, maybe I overshot at this point or I undershot at this point. And we're trying to find, like I said, that sweet spot. And you just never know how people are going to react because there's, there's so many factors involved. And so a lot of times, the way I always say it, you know, sometimes the best you can do is the best you can do. And that's what we're trying to do. I don't think anybody has an answer for it. But, but you know, to, to train somebody with the intent to, to mitigate the risk, I, I, I don't look at it from that perspective. I look at it from training to perform. And in doing so, that's how we mitigate the risk. Got it. And how about an athlete then? who's already come to you hurt and now you want to clear them for return to sport right. and you, then what are you kind of assessing yeah okay so we're in a different world okay so now we're at the rehab end of things and so the a dose of reality when when a when an athlete comes in injured we don't really know necessarily what is responsible i mean sometimes you do it's like they you know they do something obvious like they tear a hamstring and, and they do an MRI and they say, look, the hamstring's torn. And so, okay, I mean, kind of know what we're working with, but a lot of times we'll, we'll come in and, and, and all the tests will be negative, but the athlete has, you know, we, we've had a guy that come, comes in with calf pain, right? So the immediate thought is, oh, he strained his calf. And they, and they, they do the, you know, the, the pictures and MRIs or whatever, and then they can't find anything wrong, but he still has this pain, right? And so, under these circumstances, we really can't tell, um, like, in isolation, what the the cause may be. So in this case, we have to sort of take what we would normally do for performance, which is narrow variability, and we need to broaden that. So in this case, we want to expand his his capacity um, across the board. So I might try to um, maximize or optimize, if you will, um, ranges of motion that I would use to monitor the variability of the movement system to give him the opportunity to sort of figure out and problem solve the best way to move again. And then we use graded exercise. First step, putting people in a position to be successful first. And then we make that more complex and more difficult over time. So then it becomes, it transitions into training, right, at some point in time. But we, we have to restore a broad spectrum of variability from an energy system standpoint, from a movement standpoint, all those systems that we can influence within our scope of practice. And then sort of let the chips fall where they may and allow the system to sort of figure out the rest. Um, and again, a lot of it is just, just, guided progressive exercise once the initial variability is restored because again we don't know what the answer is as to why something necessarily happened and we can we can theorize and hypothesize all all day long and maybe we're right but maybe we're not so again that's why you sort of have to um, do the best you can by expanding the variability enough that you also provide variability to the limiting system, whatever that may be. Maybe it's the immune system that's hanging on and, and not managing inflammation enough. Or, you know, maybe it is the, the uh, musculoskeletal system and we do have a tissue-related problem that we just can't identify. Or maybe it's just a positional problem. We have a muscle that's eccentrically oriented, so I need to just restore movement variability for that to happen. But again, we just don't know what the answer is. So again, we're limited on the, the number of systems that we can influence within our scope. We just do the best we can under those circumstances, try to increase the variability of those systems, and then let the chips fall where they may. Does that make any sense at all? Kind of. So it's kind of like you're not necessarily you're guiding the, I guess the patient so that he's restoring his own health, kind of? Correct. That's exactly what it is. We have to just create, we have to create a, an environment within the organism, so to speak, and an environment outside of the organism that allows them to select the best possible strategies to allow um, full restoration of their capabilities. But it, like I said, there are many times where we just don't know exactly what that is because it's not obvious. And so, you know, when you, when you don't know what the answer is, it could be, let's say that there's seven systems that we can influence, and we know that we know that one of those systems is probably the limiting factor. <coughs> so which, which one do you, do you increase the variability in? You don't know. So you got to increase the variability in all of them. 
enough that that system can, can correct or be corrected, right? Because we don't heal people. People heal themselves. We provide, you know, the, the, the guidance to allow that to happen. And to be honest with you, a lot of this can just be resolved by graded activity, right? We just make it easy enough. Again, put them in a position to be successful first and then slowly increase the difficulty and complexity. And then when do you start to restrict the movement variability, restrict the systems again to optimize for that particular athlete? Well, we, athlete? Have to, we have to determine what we're going to use as a representation of health. Okay. And so in that case, it may be that they have sufficient ranges of motion in all of the necessary joints. They're pain free. They have, you know, sufficient tissue tolerance. However, we want to, want to assess that. And then again, it just becomes graded activity. As you raise intensity, the system will simplify itself. And so we have to monitor that too. So what, what we would do is we just watch the, you know, we, we would come up with uh, key performance indicators. Maybe it's hip mobility, maybe it's shoulder mobility, depending on who we're talking about. You know, with our baseball pitchers, we want to make sure that they have enough hip internal rotation on their their lead leg. We want to make sure that they have enough internal rotation of their, of their throwing shoulder for follow through and such. And so maybe those are some of the key indicators that we would use to monitor um, whether they're maintaining sort of this, this sweet spot of, of movement variability, right? Because if I raise the intensity too high or I create too much fatigue, the response for any system in your body when it reaches its threshold is to start to simplify itself and become more rigid. So the example I always use is blood pressure, right? So what's normal blood pressure? That's the correct answer because that's average blood pressure. So if you're running 100 meters in, in less than 10 seconds, what's normal blood pressure? You see what I'm getting at? So it's specific to the, to the demands. Whereas, so if, if I have chronically elevated blood pressure, then I can get peripheral adaptations that lock it in. And then that makes it my normal blood pressure. Unfortunately, it's too high, right? So we don't necessarily know what optimum is under every circumstance. So we, we kind of have to figure that, that part out. But like I said, we can usually do that through graded activity. Got it. Does that help? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I can let someone else go, or I can have some more too. Uh, anybody other than Campo have a question? <laughs> Does anybody need a clarification on that first and foremost? Okay, Stephen, <coughs> you got one? Yeah, I, I had a question about. Um, are you able to use the pectoralis major to elevate or depress the sternum depending on humerus position? Um, I do you need more context than that? You, are you talking about for respiration then? Yeah, so um, I guess it all came about like I have a like a pectus excavatum and right. so I was thinking, you know, maybe more like the, you know, like the stability ball rollout video that you posted yesterday, uh -huh. like an activity like that might be a good activity for me where the humerus is fixed out in front of my body, have some pectoralis major activity as well as, um, you know, thoracic retraction. Whereas maybe for someone that's more of the, the pectus, is it car carnitum? Yeah. Um, Wait, forward. Yeah, you know, like a, uh, you know, like a holding the top position of a dip or something like that. Would would that help depress the sternum versus um, elevate it in that scenario because the humerus position is different? Well, I don't think I don't know how much actual change you're going to get, um, but but maintaining the the mobility of say like the the um, sternoclavicular joint is kind of a monster from a long-term perspective as far as maintaining respiration. Uh, case in point, you get people with AC joint problems. Um, a lot of times an AC joint problem is just a, an SC joint that doesn't, doesn't have its normal uh, hinging 
normal pivot, right? So if, if the sternum can't pivot like this, it tends to go up and down, and then the rotation occurs at a joint that's not supposed to rotate, right? So that's an AC joint problem. Um, as far as actually changing the, the shape of the rib cage, and in a case of like excavatum, I don't know how much motion you're gonna get out of that considering the fact that the, the typical best case scenario is to put a rod in there and, um, and actually reshape the, the rib cage. Um, but again, from a maintenance standpoint, it might not be a bad idea to use that to maintain <coughs> if you're having issues, of course. But, but I think from in, in, under any circumstance, um, I think your, your thought process is correct. Yeah. I, I guess, um, you know, thinking of what would be good, you know, maybe strength training activities for someone with, you know, maybe a, a very shallow thorax in the anterior posterior direction versus Right. The other way, very deep. Um, I, the the way it came about is I have a client that I'm working with who it has you know the very um, you know very uh, a big diameter anterior to posterior through his thorax, uh -huh. and I can't I, I can't imagine that our two exercise prescriptions would be the same. You know what I mean? Like so, how how would I change a therapy program or change a strength training program? maybe based on thorax shape as well as, uh, you know, HG, IR, or ER measures. Right. Um, I, I, again, I, I, like, I like where your thought process is going. Um, first, first thing you got to get to remember, though, is that w the, the problem is not um, uh, maybe strength training related yet in that yeah. first phase of, of your thought process. It's pressure related. What you're, yeah. what you're dealing with is where the pressure can go and where the pressure can't go. And that's first and foremost what has to be addressed. If you try to do it strictly through strength training, I don't know, again, I, I think there might be cases where you could do this, but I don't know necessarily whether um, you're, you're gonna be able to manage the pressures as much because mm -hmm. if you're trying to drive strength, there's gonna be a lot of breath holding issues and you might not be able to change pressures. And if the intensity is too high, then this, again, the, simple, the system is going to simplify itself by reducing degrees of freedom. So you're gonna to have to, to figure out, okay, what intensity can I use that allows me to move the pressure, reposition, literally reposition the, the, the rib cage, spine, pelvis, where, whatever I'm trying to, to um, manipulate in regards to position, right? What allows that to happen? You know, we like we can we can use like a uh, sort of like a bilateral hamstring loaded pullover, right? To uh, do what we were talking about before about about keeping the upper rib cage in that that inhalation position and then exhaling against that. That mm -hmm. actually provides us a, a really nice um, stable anchor to pull against to pull the rib cage down. But again, if we use too much weight, then we're not going to be able to move anything because you're going to end up with, with too much air trapped and you're gonna get, not gonna get any rib cage movement. So then you actually reduce the amount of mobility that you're shooting for. So again, there's, there's, a, there's gonna be a sweet spot in regards to the intensity level of the activity that you're gonna use initially. Once you've established a broad variability in the areas that you're trying to address, then I think you can start to bring in a little bit more intensity with the, with the caveat that you still need to monitor it for how much you know, loss of variability you're willing to accept because it's going to happen if intensity gets high enough. So at a, at a low intensity, what, what would be some strategies that you use to say maybe drive more, you know, pressure anterior posteriorly versus uh, laterally and things like that? Well, anterior is easy, right? <laughs> Extension? Yeah, it's like... Uh, do a prone press up for for ten reps and just see how much airflow you can get to the front. Um, it, it tends to work really, really well. Um, so you you can kind of tell by the shape of the thorax as to where that that air is going to go. You know, mm -hmm. if I need to move air into the like the dorsal rostral intercostal area, so the area between the scapula, 
right? That area needs to be open. Well, how do I open that area? Well, I have to protract the scapula, right? Mm -hmm. And then the resultant force of, of rhomboids and, and middle low trap is actually going to kind of pop out that, that spine as long as I've got pressure coming from the other side, which is airflow, right? Mm -hmm. And so I use that in combination. And then any activity, you could do crab walks, okay, um, with, your, with your younger athletes and kids, and you'll get that effect if you do, do the crab walk. You can also do it with a bear crawl. It all depends on, on relative position of the, of the trunk um, and, and uh, you know, what muscle activity that you're driving and while they have to breathe through it. So, you know, those, those silly gym class activities that we did in, you know, first and second grade are actually really good activities to maintain uh, pressure control throughout the thorax and the pelvis. So you, you can kind of see where it goes, but with the understanding that the, the, the default path of least resistance is usually anterior inferior rib cage. Because gravity works, if we're, if we're upright, the airflow is going to be easier to get to the lower part of the lung, and because it's easier for us to extend than it is to maintain that, that um, the uh, posteriorly retracted thorax, it's just easier to get airflow anterior uh, inferior. What, what would you do to maybe, um, you know, improve, you know, a bucket handle action or to improve... Uh, you know, rib cage, uh, you know, medial lateral diameter, or you know, is that something you could even change or influence, you know, with someone with that really deep thorax? You mean like an eight, like an, they're, they're more anterior, posteriorly? Um, yeah, like, so speak? yeah, yeah. Like, like, like look like a dog, you know, like you said, like standing yeah. up. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, first thing you have to do is you got to bring the rib cage back. Right. And so we would do that in quadruped because that's what they're trying to do. Right. They're trying to go quadruped on you. And I can use, I can use my push forward, which actually brings the thorax back and opens mm -hmm. the infrasternal angle. We've always talked about that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I do that and I have some element of control and the way I can tell is I just remeasure my, I remeasure the angle, you know, there's Bill's new logo, by the way. Um, anyway, <laughs> Um, we remeasure that once we can get some um, semblance of a, of a wider infrasternal angle, then we know we have a better diaphragm position to work with. And then I can start to work frontal plane stuff. So um, something as simple as, as a, an, an overhead press on one side and then, you know, completing the reach process where I actually have to side bend a little bit away from the pressing side. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that opens up that that bucket handle side. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, the the, you know, just a good diaphragm position in and of itself is going to have a, a strong effect on that. OK. Because right? that's what that's what causes the bucket handling in the first place. Is so the even, even if they're like already quick, crazy, like sway back posture, you know, like hips way forward mm -hmm. like they artificially kind of retracted their rib cage and, and flexed it, you still need to retract the thorax okay so so but in, in in that case most likely do they have like a vertical sternum uh his i mean his sternum just swung up like i mean it's so, 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 so it's an inhalation i i believe so so you've got a, you've got you've got a, an in, inhaled position of this, okay. Um, and so then you you could you could definitely use pecs to do that. And and where where I would put them is with their hands behind them. So mm -hmm. yeah. the crab position becomes an excellent position for that, because that's what's going to pull the sternum downward, right? So think about reaching back, mm -hmm. right? And so again, I can use my pec to do that. Yeah. And then I, and, but then I, and I can keep my pelvis underneath me at the same time. Then you're, you're going to get a nice effect because then you're going to get that, you're going to get the posterior medial spinal expansion that you typically don't have under those circumstances. Right. I get dorsal rostral expansion between the, the scapula and I get the sternum into an exhaled position. 
Yeah. We, um, I was reading about rib torsions a little bit. Would that be a case where be, because the sternal position doesn't match the spinal position, he probably has some kind of external rib torsion? And so would there be, would there be any benefit to, you know, having him lay on his back so that he has some, uh, you know, he, that'll force him out of the sway back posture and then try to get rib internal rotation on top of that. So you kind of flip it on its head. So he goes from a flex spine with externally rotate, externally torsioned ribs to uh, a relatively extended spine with internally torsioned ribs. Yeah, and you could even do that on one side at a time. Yeah. And you could take care of your bucket handle problem probably at the same time. We think about it. So like you put him, put him in like a, uh, a D1 extension on one side and a D2 flexion on the other side. Mm -hmm. You could drive it that way. Like a, like a PNF pull apart where you're. Yeah. You, 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 you may be able to do, kill two birds with one stone there and, mm -hmm. and address the whole thing all at once. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That might work. Cool. Yeah. I like so, that. Any more, Steven? So laying, laying him on his back might not be a bad thing. It might not. I, okay, let me, let me offer you this. If you try it, what's the worst that could happen? Nothing. Yeah, it doesn't work. I mean, <laughs> honestly, it's, it's, it's relatively safe to fail, right? We always talk yeah. about safe to fail experiments. That's what we have to do because we don't know, yeah. right? If, if, it, if it's logical, if it fits the, the, the structural constraints and it makes sense, it's worth a try. It's definitely worth a try. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll let someone else go now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Step on up. Who's up? Hey, Jake. All right. Um, what do you think of the RPR system? And I, I just kind of like to hear your thoughts on that. It's kind of like that the hot new thing, I guess, in, in sports performance and fitness. Uh, we have a doctor in town that, that is associated with them and, and works with a lot of my clients just in my gym. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they come back talking about how, you know, they feel so much better when they do it. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I don't know much about it. And I'm just kind of curious to, to hear your thoughts. Um, honestly, I don't know much about it either, my brother. Like it, be it, activated, the Douglas Hill. It's called be, be activated. Uh, Douglas Hill, I guess, is some South African... Yeah. Um, that, yeah. Cal Dietz would probably be the guy to talk to because I know he uses it rather extensively. Um, but I think Anthony, he's part of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anthony Donskov, I know, is a, is a friend who has actually taken the course. I think, I think Mike Ranfone has, has done it as well. So if, if, you, know, if you know Mike. Um, I, I don't have any direct experience with it. I have observed it on, on a couple of videos, and that's the extent of it. Um, it, it, remind, <laughs> it reminds – me to some degree on on there's some uh, old osteopathic literature actually it's not necessarily old i think they still talk about it. chapman's reflex points um there's certain areas that that may have some influence over the autonomic nervous system and so that might be why they get some of the responses that they do um and so in some cases they might be stimulatory points right and in some cases they might be inhibitory depending on what the goal might be. If you look at some of the warm-up videos that I've seen on, on some of the, um, the programs that are using it, they're, they're doing it within their, their dynamic mobility circuits or they're doing it prior to a lift. And then there's other elements that, that they'll do where someone is actually treating someone else and then they'll get the restoration of mobility. And so again, that's why it reminds me of these Chapman reflex points because that's that's essentially what can happen. But again, I don't have any direct experience with it whatsoever, so I don't really have a strong opinion necessarily. Um, and and it, I, would, I would prefer not to offer you much more than that, unfortunately. I just don't think about it very much. It's not something that I'm pursuing right now at all. Um, and, and so uh, maybe someday down the road, if it, if it survives it's, it, it, as a useful tool, then you know, maybe I'll, I'll you know... <coughs> expose myself to it a little bit deeper, but, but that's all I got. So. Good enough. Thanks. Appreciate if, it. If you, need me, if you ser but seriously, drop me a, drop me a, a, a private message if you want. And if you want to 
go into it deeper, I can hook you up with those guys that have actually taken the course and they can give you a stronger opinion. Okay. Yeah. I live really close to uh, Chris Corifist who, who is, oh, well, there you go. Who, so I, yeah, I could reach out to him. I was just curious. Yeah. No, I don't, party. Yeah. Okay. I don't think about it. All right. I found one thing you don't think about. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. All right, man. Who's next? Who else is on the call? Is Lucy on? James's beard is here. <laughs> All right. There's Lucy. She's watching the screen. She, you're watching the screen. She looks like she's sleeping. Yeah, that's Lucy right there. Like this, Lucy? <laughs> Is that why your screen is dark? <laughs> got my blue blockers on. Did you see Rufus? Oh, you have them on? Oh, look yeah. at you. you got them on. Good job. Why is your screen so, so dark? dark? I'm, I'm still not I don't know. Forest bathing, though. <laughs> <laughs> you should pick up forest bathing, that's for sure. Forest bathing? Yeah, I ain't doing that. I do that. <laughs> uh, somebody raised their hand. Who raised their hand? Patrick. I say, Patrick, hold on one sec. Campo had one, right? We can we can loop back around. Uh, well, I had a few from like a bunch of our discussions. Are you talking about the the first one I had? We're gonna take turns. You pick which one's most important to you. All right. Um, Bill, when you were talking to Patrick about uh, rehabbing a, a patient back to um, return to play, where you talked about like setting up an internal and an external environment, I'm assuming. So well, what are some of the things that will go into that internal environment? But I'm thinking my when you said that, my head kind of went straight to like, that person's own self-efficacy and self-belief that they actually will get better. Sure. Do you have a lot of patients that actually turn more into like a psychological case rather than, you know, really anything in our scope? Um, I suppose there's, there's elements of that, you know, when you have an interpersonal communication, there's always going to be an element of that. And I do have people that, that have, you know, they, they've been treated for anxieties and, you know, depression, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I don't try to play amateur psychologists, um, but you know, you, you communicate a certain way with those people. You support those people as best that you can and you provide them measures of success, right? So however small the, the gain may be and you try to shift the um, the influence of their outcome towards them and, and get them to recognize that fact. And that's very powerful, right? Um, and then, you know, one of the things that you always want to try to emphasize is you try to keep them right at their perceived self-image plus or minus a couple of degrees. One, we're accelerating learning, but two, again, we're, we're, we're improving that, that self-efficacy in the first place, right? And so there's always that element, I think. I don't know if that's what you were hoping for, but. No, yeah. I mean, just recently, like the main things I've been grappling with, it's just like, especially with people like that, that even have previously like diagnosed, like psychological um, things that they're dealing with. It's like, I don't know. How, if we're only influencing them for like one hour out of a week sometimes, and they go out into the real world and 24 seven, they're grappling with all of that thing, all of that, that can certainly influence them. Right. How much influence do we really have? Well, now? what if, what if you're the best part of their day? Then how much of an influence do you think you are? Right. So, so don't, don't consider volume as, as the measuring stick, right? The amount of time because, it could be, you, you might be the most powerful thing that influences them just by being the person that smiles at them and the person that talks to them and the person that encourages them and actually shows them that they're actually being successful, right? 
and maybe that carries over to every other minute of the day. So, you know, don't, don't, don't belittle the, the time that you do have with those people just because, you know, 23 hours of the day they're out there and an hour of the day they're with you. I don't, I don't, I don't discount that value at all. Um, and again, I don't know, and I don't think you know, right, as to how much of an impact it is, but I don't think that that, that should deter you from trying to maximize the impact that you do have in a favorable way because you just don't know how much it could. I mean, literally, you might be the only person that they talk to today. And, and yeah, that'd be kind of scary if you were it, huh? And uh, I'm kidding. Um, but seriously, it's like, you could be the, you, you could be the smiling face. You could be the person that, that they go, wow, you know, Campo was, was really supportive of me today. Maybe I should think a little bit differently about myself or, or how I perceive everything else. So, you know, don't sell yourself short just because you don't have all 24 of their hours. Patrick? Uh, I had a question about um, dealing with how do you approach asymmetries in athletes who are who, who will be inherently asymmetrical, like baseball players? If you know that they're going to be totally different from right to left um, in terms of like training them. What are you doing to um, acknowledge those, or how do you acknowledge those asymmetries? You know, it, it's kind of a similar process that we were talking about before is that, what, you know, we have to sort of get to know these people as much as we can as to, you know, when do they, when do they um, perform optimally? Because again, we expect some asymmetries, right? And some of those are performance related. Some of those are performance enhancing. So I don't want to take something away that they, that they utilize um, as long as it, again, we have to, make a determination as to what we think is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And that's different for each athlete. And then it's a matter of ongoing monitoring. We can't, we can't pigeonhole one person into too big of a group, right? We try, we always talk about N equals one at IFAST is that, you know, everybody is, is similar in their, their structural constraints. We had, we all tend to have knees and hips and shoulders and stuff that, that tend to function similarly. So we kind of know what our expectations should be under, uh, you know, normal uh, aspects of variability. But then we also have to look at them from an individual basis. It's like if I've got a left-handed thrower, you know, there's certain expectations that uh, that I'm going to 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 have in regards to what would be acceptable in regards to how their shoulders should move, because again, I have a a left side performance on a right oriented body is going to be a little bit different from what I would expect from, you know, a right-handed pitcher. So give you for instance, we had a dude that came in, he, he pitches for one of the major league teams and he's been thrown, he's been pitching for, I don't know, maybe nine or 10 years, I think in the majors. And he has, he has a, uh, a separation of the, uh, his left ribs from his sternum. It's like a, just a little chronic separation that is scarred now, but that's literally how he created enough mobility to, to, you know, get into the cocking phase of throwing. That's, that's what he used for many, many years. And, and um, so in that case, I would have to say that that's probably acceptable under his circumstance. Whereas if I saw that on a, a typical patient walking in the door, I would, I would have much greater concern. In this case, it wasn't painful, right? It was just an adaptation that he had developed over time. Um, you'll see um, labral tears in, in baseball players uh, that, you know, under many circumstances, people might freak out about. Um, but maybe that's literally how they create enough range of motion to throw as far and as hard as they do. So again, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable as an, as an asymmetry or as an adaptive change is going to depend on the human. And so I don't know if we can make like, like a hard and fast rule um, other than if we're in a situation where we're dealing with a, a pain related issue, we need to definitely increase variability across as many systems as we can influence to get a favorable outcome in regards to 
um, one of the outputs, which is pain. And then to give us enough uh, adaptive potential to restore performance, knowing that we're going to intentionally reduce the variability at some point in time to narrow their variability so they become really, really great at maybe one or two things that they need to be able to be great at to do what they do. So a lot of this just comes down to, okay, measure, train, see what happens, what do we like, what do we not like, right? So we, we have what we call amplification and dampening strategies. So if it's something that I do like, I want more of that under many cases. If it's something I don't like, then I want to take it away. And then I just try to find like the ideal for that individual. And then that's what we train for. So I, it, it's probably not like the best answer you ever, you ever have got because it does, it's not hard and fast to say, oh, we want exactly this many degrees of this joint motion because that just doesn't happen. In, in reality, it just doesn't happen. You know? And we can't treat everybody the same. Got it. That makes sense. So it depends. Depends on the person. So it depends. Depends on the yeah, person. No, no. Yeah, I feel like the more I learn, like that's always like the right answer nowadays. But but so so for for you though, and, and it's kind of like I like I always say is like how many it depends as do you have, right? And that comes with with experience and exposures to all the different elements of, of what we do. So the more times you see something, the, the more times you, know, you can make a, a decision and then you see a different outcome. And that gives you more options to bring to the table as to how you're going to influence someone the next time. And then you do your safe to fail experiment and you say, oh, that worked great, I'm brilliant. And then the next time you go, oh, that was lousy, that was a bad idea, I'm an idiot. So, you know. We all have those moments, no matter what anybody says about how wonderful and great they might be, um, we all fail. Um, hopefully we do, and so we get better. That's how we get better. Um, but anyway, don't, don't, don't stress out about it so much. You look at this worried look on your face, like I'm never gonna figure this out, and all it is is exposures, my friend. Appreciate that. <laughs> Patrick's almost as carefree as Mike Err. <laughs> pretty hard to be hard, pretty hard to be that carefree. <laughs> Steve, I heard him on a pod, Mike's podcast. Um, oh yeah, that was, that was a long time ago though. It was like one of the old ones. <laughs> was it good? Should I listen to it? Yeah, dude. I actually went back to all the old ones because I listened to all the new ones. All right. Uh, Steven, you got one. You're muted. Okay. Uh, of course. Um, <laughs> Bill, could you, uh, going off Campo's first question about, uh, and kind of your explanation of the elbow, um, could you kind of stack the wrist and shoulder on top of it in terms of determining orientation and compensation? Like what, what tests you would use to determine orientation and compensation at the wrist and shoulder sure I mean, so so go through like your your shoulder range of motion algorithm mm -hmm. and that typically allows you to determine the the position of the of the glenohumeral joint does it not yeah are, are, is that fair to say so you're going to have an orientation or a compensatory activity that's going to allow you to determine where that the humerus is actually resting mm -hmm. right whether it be an internal and external rotation so like, just, let's just say that, okay, if I test somebody's external rotation at 90 degrees of abduction and it's only 75 degrees, it would be safe to say that that humerus is oriented into internal rotation, correct? Um, I suppose, uh, yes. I mean, and again, there, there might be situations where it's not, but, but again, we're just looking at, we're looking at this in a, in a, in a uh, specific scenario. Um, so if I know where the humerus is, and then everything off of that should should have some level of, of predictive capability, right? Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, the forearm would follow the humerus. If it's, if it's oriented into internal rotation, I would expect there to be um, a greater um, relative position of, of pronation, okay, mm -hmm. at rest. But again, and for them to bring the hand to neutral, 
they might supinate out of it, right? So that would be a compensatory motion into supination to bring the wrist to neutral. Um, which, if I supinate the wrist, then I should have um, a uh, – uh, um, oh, man, I'm a little tired. Hang on a second. So I pronate, I'm going to lose ulnar deviation and extension. If I supinate, I'm going to lose flexion and radial deviation. There you go. So, so that, will <laughs> that will allow me to sort of determine where the elbow really is. So if I'm not really sure how much pronation and supination I have, I can use the wrist at the, at the one end, and I can use the shoulder at the other end to sort of determine where that elbow is actually resting. Right? And based on that, again, what I'm looking for is, is to restore variability at the elbow where I have the limited limitation in motion is uh, trying to reorient his drawings again. Are you holding up your drawings there, brother? Or are you just showing your belly? No. Okay. <laughs> Alan Tucker says hi. Hi, Alan. The Alan Tucker. I can't hear her, but... Hey, hey, there you go. So, so what about at the, at the shoulder? Say you, you know, how do you determine if it's an orientation or compensation? Do you use the hip test to determine that, or do you use a hip test? Like, well, like if you know, if they couldn't, if they presented as a left AIC, but you know, maybe they had uh, full external rotation on their left shoulder. Like, how would you determine if it was an orientation or compensation at the at the humerus? Well, you, you have to look at, so you have to look at all of your, all of your thorax tests, right? Mm -hmm. So where, where can they get air is your number one determination of, of the orientation of the thorax, right? Okay, so, so if I can determine where the airflow is, and I can determine where the scapula rests, which would give me, an, a, 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 again, following a predictive model of where the humerus would rest, Right? And you can be wrong, you know, <laughs> it happens. So, but, but again, if I know where the airflow is going, then I know where the rib orientation should be, right? I mean, just, again, just go through your shoulder algorithm of, of measurement. You know, if I've got a loss of bilateral internal rotation and bilateral horizontal abduction, where do you think the scapular rests? They're gonna both Correct be- action. They're so, be internally rotated, right? Okay, yeah. so if if the if the scapula internally rotates, protracts, you'd expect humerus to follow it, elbow to follow it, wrist to follow it. Yep. I'll, I'll go Absolutely. along. Right, and and so then everything after everything off of that, then you you determine okay, this is an orientation or or a compensatory activity, right? In, in regards to determining where airflow goes, is that outside of kind of the, you know, posterior mediastinal expansion test and apical expansion test. I don't use, it, I don't use those tests. Well, and I guess that's what I'm getting at. It is I like that, I guess I feel similarly, what, what do you use to determine specifically where the airflow goes then like? Right, so, so you, can, you can manually provide diaphragm position, correct? Mm -hmm. right. And then I can use um, my ability to mobilize ribs as a group, right? Whether it be the, the upper rib cage. So, so if we break the if we break the rib cage into um, segments of where we know that inhalation should occur, primary exhalation should occur. I can tell where the restrictions lie and where the paths of least, least resistance are. Right, you can basically break up the rib cage into four, into four quadrants, right, anterior and posterior, and I can determine where that airflow goes. And based on where that airflow is, that's where that would should determine where the scapula would rest. How, how do you determine the airflow of each quadrant? Is it manually, like you're saying, you know? depress there, one side of the rib cage there's an element of observation and there's an element of palpation it's like and it's not perfect it's like these things aren't perfect right mm -hmm. um and again sometimes the best you can do is the best you can do but it's a representative model so so daniel dennett 
is a the, you know modern day philosopher, right? And he talks about modeling. He said he goes he goes models are designed to make the complex more simple so we can manage it. So we're creating a very simplistic model of a very complex phenomenon. Am I correct? And so you know sometimes the best you can do is the best you can do. And yeah, I'm going to create a restriction in the in the airflow, and I'm going to see what happens. You know, and how I measure that um, is any number of different ways, right? So some of it is going to be through palpation. Some of it's going to be through observation. Right? So I make my best estimate as to what I'm seeing, and then I start to treat. And I do that in a safe-to-fail environment, and then I see what happens. And if I have a good outcome, I keep doing that stuff. And if I have a bad outcome, I do something else. Okay, so you wouldn't necessarily use the, the HG, the, the humorous measures to determine um, thorax position. It would be more assessing the, the, the thorax itself. Right, well, so, so let me ask you a question to, to answer your question. Do you think you can trust those, those glenohumeral measurements in all cases that those are totally accurate and they're not compensatory activities associated with laxity? Um, no. <laughs> So, so what do you what do you do what do you do when you have somebody that has a, a flat sternum and upper and a flat upper rib cage? So you know that that the pressure is too high; they can't get air in there, right? And mm. they have full range of motion of both shoulders. Do you trust those measures when you know um, that they can't get air into the upper rib cage? I, I would assu- I would assume they probably can't, you know, just right. from you right. know visual observation, but correct. So, so, so we know that we can't necessarily trust the, the, the shoulder measurements. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Again, people don't like that answer, but get used to it because sometimes we just don't know. So you, you, you determine the best course of action based on the, the test that you can do. And you, know, you try to weight the tests against each other and you come up with the best course of action and then you execute in a safe manner and then you see what happens. And then you, so you test and you retest. Okay, did I do something good or did I not do something good? All right. I know people hate these answers, my brother, but that's <laughs> reality. Nobody wants to talk about, about, oh, I fail. I fail every day, you know, and nobody wants to say that because, you know, you can't sell that. Yeah. Thank, thank you. That, that helps a lot in terms of just determining what to use, you know, HG measures for and yep. looking at a bigger picture than just, you know, IRER flexion, all that stuff. Yeah, it would be nice. It would be nice if there was no compensatory activities associated with tissue change. But you know what? Sometimes there is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Bill. It's six thirty-five. Nine thirty-five. <laughs> um, do you want to call it quits? Uh, we could do one more. How about that? Does Rufus have a question? Let somebody else go. And if they don't go. But, so I want to hear what you've been asking Bill all day, because I know you've been together all day. Like, no, we haven't been it's, together all day. <laughs> it's a, Rufus, it's a day. So I know you've been together all day. <laughs> so ask Ty this question. Okay, Bill, Bill was busy doing his thing. Um... You know, we do, we do a vertical jump test or a standing long jump test or some measurable test like that, right, to, quote, test athleticism, right, or explosiveness or whatever you want to say, okay? My question is, are those necessarily the best tests or is there something better that would test the true explosiveness? Uh, are, are you are you uh, are you saying that um, that those tests may not be specific to represent uh, an athlete's explosiveness? Yes, I, I I won't disagree with that. I I think that um, you know ultimately the the outcome within the sport would be the best measure, right? Right, but we're talking about like a combine or something. Right. Like no, I got, right. oh well, you know, under those circumstances, who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if our intent to, as we train somebody <laughs> is, to, is to make some, some uh, uh, measure 
change, right? We're, we're trying to promote an adaptation. So like say we're trying to improve vertical jump or something right. like that as a representation of increased explosiveness, then using a test and a retest is probably the best way to go because we really don't have the specific environment to, to determine whether the athlete is actually getting better or not. Okay. Then, then, so my question is, would testing the rate of force development be a better way of, of measuring what we're trying to measure? Maybe. Okay. So maybe. So at least there, I have a measure of how quickly I can develop for maximal force. Right. Maximal velocity. But again, so but but you're always doing that in it within it. So so how whatever context that you're measuring that in always becomes that that specific context. So it, it, so if I if I do it with a barbell on my back, does that mean that that my rate of force development is better on the field when I don't have a barbell on my back? We we can't say that to any degree of confidence. Well, but, but um, I, I understand that part, but is it a better indicator of how I'm going to perform on the field as opposed to a, ver a vertical jump or a long jump or something like that? I, we're, but we're not, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think that we're, I don't think that we're actually training our ability on the field at any time when we're doing supplementary training. No, I, I so I don't think anything, so, so. I, let me stop you for just a second. I don't think that anything that we do is representative of anybody's ability to change what they do on the field or on the court. What we're trying to do is we're trying to improve their, their, uh, their capabilities in the hopes that we alter their ability to, to perform on the court or on the field, because we're not testing anything within the realm of sport. Right. And, and there may be some other aspect that we don't even touch that allows them to do that. So for instance, someone's um, the, the ability to be aware of their position on the court relative to everyone else may be the entire key to their existence. Right. So um, to, to quote Wayne Gretzky and to make Lance smile just a little bit, Wayne Gretzky would always say, they, they said, they said, well, how do you, how do you, you know, how are you so good at what you do? You're not the biggest guy and you're not the fastest guy and you're not the strongest guy. And Wayne Gretzky would always say, well, instead of going where the puck is like everybody else, I go where I think the puck's going to be. And so again, there's, there's an element of performance there that we don't even touch. Our goal is to address the systems Right. that they're using in their performance and try to optimize those systems. So again, we, we, we use these field tests as a representation of are those systems adapting and changing in a favorable direction that we think is going to influence the outcome. I don't think we can ever prove that, that we're doing anything um, that is specific enough to impact that. And so I don't think that there's one measure. Okay. So I don't think we can say that, oh, rate of force development is the key to the measure. Um, well, maybe, maybe not, but under what circumstance are we measuring rate of force development? Is it unweighted or is it weighted? Well, if it's weighted, how does that influence the, the outcome when I'm unweighted? It's not the same. So again, what, what we're actually testing is, is a, a, a small segment of abilities that, you know, in a multifactorial environment may influence the outcome. So I don't think there's one that's better necessarily. It might be one for this person that, that okay, this is consistently improving in, um, say, his power output, um, you know, in observed output in a game is better. Then we can say, okay, maybe that this is the, the relationship. But, again, we're, we're trying to address the, the physical abilities that underlie performance. I don't necessarily that, – that we're creating performance, and so there's not going to be one measure that, that, that gives us the answer. Okay. So, but if, if – at the way we currently look at it, if, if one guy has a 30-inch vertical jump and one guy has a 35-inch vertical jump, we think of 35 – more explosively, we don't take into account how long he takes to get there. We do. No, no. And I fast, we do. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. nobody else does. Well, I think a lot of people do. Let's, let's not, let's oh, not, okay, okay. let's not look I, at, I look at it that way. I, I don't know who, but go, but right. so, so, you know, to me, it doesn't, the 35 inch vertical is nice and it's important, but can I do that? Does it take me right. a if, half second or does it take me 0.2 seconds? I totally, I totally get where you're coming from. 
I totally get where you're coming from. So, that, that's all. Yeah. Asking, so. No, I, 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 and again, I'm not belittling rate of force development either. I'm right. just saying that it's like, yeah, may, maybe that is the measure that we want to use for this person. Right. But we don't know. That's why we measure a bunch of stuff. Right. We're not just measuring one thing when we're measuring the athletes, we're measuring a number of different things. And we're saying, okay, for this person, what is the, what is that key performance indicator that's going to let us know that, yeah, we might be impacting the, the aspect of performance that's going to, you know, change right. the way that they perform in the court in the field. Um, so that did I, no, it's fine. I don't want to take up any more time. Well, are you, are you like frustrated with me or something, brother? No, I still love you. Man. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Oh, I got a hug from Rufus. He's a human. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Well, thanks for showing up again. Bill, thanks for staying up for us. This was good. Yeah. Bedtime. Come prepared for next month with your questions. Patrick, Campo, Stephen, I'm sure you'll have more. Jake? If you learn about RPR or whatever it's called, you can uh, teach us all about yeah. it. I think we should put a little pressure on Jake for this one since he brought it up. What I think that? we should schedule that. Yeah, we're going to schedule the next one around Jake's schedule. Oh, God. <laughs> all right, it's on. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Can I get a donation so I can go to one of the seminars, though? <laughs> I'll collect from all of you guys. You I might know out. some people who want to donate to you. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm willing. I'll go fund me. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. There you go. Kick Thanks, all right, guys. Thanks for showing up. Night, guys. Two news. See you. Bye.